Greetings, comrades! Today we continue our journey through the third level of the Russian conspiracy iceberg. Today we have some more theories about the origin of the Slavs and about the ancient cataclysm which wiped out all the rich humans from the face of the earth. We have psychics in the ranks of the USSR army, some prophecies about World War 3 and a story about Bigfoot from the mountains of Abkhazia. Do not miss it. ROC equals KGB A conspiracy theory is that most of the high-ranking clergymen of the Russian Orthodox Church were agents or collaborators of the KGB during Soviet times. The theory was born out of the fact that during the Soviet years, as we know, the Church was under unimaginable pressure. Only by the 1970s and 1980s did the persecution of religion weaken a bit, and some religious activity in the country became possible. But some argue that all this was due to the fact that the religious authorities in the USSR made a deal with the real authorities, namely the security services. As it happened, for example, in friendly socialist Bulgaria. In 2012, they studied the archives of local special services and found out that 11 out of 15 metropolitans of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church cooperated with the Bulgarian state security. As for the USSR, in the memoir, several KGB generals and employees of the Council for Religious Affairs frankly stated that all heads of religious organizations in the country, without exceptions, were appointed by two non-church organizations, the Ideological Department of the CPSU Central Committee and the State Security Committee, for the Department of the Fifth Directorate. In 1989-1993, in the Soviet Union and then in Russia, attempts were made to investigate the history of cooperation between the Church and the Secret Services, but they did not lead to anything, except for one case. In 1992, Metropolitan Chrysostomov Vilnius and Lithuania confessed that he cooperated with the KGB. He provided the authorities with information of a diplomatic nature. Other clergymen denied everything. Recently, a Swiss newspaper published an investigation where, with reference to declassified documents of the Swiss Federal Police interviews and publications, it was reported that Patriarch Kirill himself was a KGB agent under the pseudonym Mikhailov while working in Geneva in the 1970s for the World Council of Churches. According to the publication, he was supposed to collect information about members of the World Council of Churches and influence their behavior towards the Soviet Union. The Russian Orthodox Church called this information politically motivated speculation. Hyperborea Hyperborea is consistently mentioned by me at least once a level as the homeland of the ancestors of the Slavs. But still, what is it? Actually, in ancient Greek mythology, Hyperborea is some legendary northern country where superhumans lived and everything was great. Hyperboreans possessed telekinesis and were immortal and their technology was ahead of time for thousands of years. And what do we have north of Greece? Well, lots of things, but in this case, of course, Russia. And that means that Hyperborea should be found somewhere in our country. Especially since the 19th and 20th century, the idea of Hyperborea as the ancestral home of the present humanity, the white Aryan or Nordic race, or a certain nation, in our case, the Russians, became very popular. Where could Hyperborea be located? Lots of options. In the Ural Mountains, in Karelia, or the Kola Peninsula, in Greenland, in the Arctic Ocean at last. This idea is especially popular among esotericists, Russian nationalists and neo-pagans. But as you understand, so far no one has found the legendary Hyperborea. Rasputin's Prophecies Grigory Rasputin was a man of many talents, just ask Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna. But today we are interested in his talent as a soothsayer. In his book Pious Reflections, published in St. Petersburg in 1912, he gives a lot of very detailed prophecies, some of which have indeed come true and the other, let's hope, will never come true. Thus, he predicted the execution of the royal family and the coup of the 1917, his own demise as well as disaster at nuclear power plants. That said, he did describe the effects of radiation contamination pretty well, something that was still largely unexplored at that time. And which of the things the old man foretold we must still wait for? He predicted human cloning, the complete loss of moral values, global climate change, the rose will bloom in December and in June there will be snow, and three world wars. Here's how he described the third. From the west will come a bloodthirsty prince who will enslave men with wealth, and from the east will come another prince who will enslave men with poverty. 
Well, let's wait and see. Zana from Tchin In the middle of the 19th century, rumors of a Bigfoot living in the forest near Mount Zadan spread in Abkhazia. Prince Ajba, who went out into the forest to hunt, decided to catch it. He did this by leaving brightly colored pants in a prominent place, which attracted the creature. On closer inspection of the Bigfoot was a hairy, two-meter-tall woman. The dark brown hair covered her entire body, especially the lower part of it. The skin was dark gray. The face was also covered with hair, but it was much shorter. The hair on her head started almost from her eyebrows, its length reaching her back. The eyes were red. The woman was named Zanna, and Prince Ajba gave her to Prince Edja Genaba, who brought her to Tchin village. At first, the prince had to imprison her in an enclosure of vertical timbers and keep her in chains because of her violent temper. However, they managed to subdue her, and Zanna began to live among the locals. But she preferred to walk naked and slept in a hole she had dug herself. According to eyewitnesses, she could run at the speed of a horse and could lift a sack weighing 80 kilograms with one hand. Her favorite pastimes were swimming in the river and drinking. She also did some chores that required a lot of physical strength around the village. She did not learn to speak, but she knew her name. She had intimate relations with some men, including the prince, and gave birth to four children. Was buried presumably in a local cemetery. This story has interested cryptozoologists from the middle of the 20th century, and they have been carried out extensive researches which confirmed the story. Yes, it appears that such a woman did indeed live in the village of Tchin, but who was she? There are really only two possibilities. The first is that Zana was a relic hominid, I mean a yeti, or Bigfoot, I guess. Or perhaps a Neanderthal who somehow survived in the Caucasian mountains until the 19th century. However, there is no evidence of this, because her descendants look quite normal. A hybrid with a relic hominid should look much more distinctive. The second version is that Zana was a black woman who suffered from mental illness. The fact is that on the territory of Abkhazia since the 19th century, there is a small community of the so-called Black Abkhazians. Perhaps they came from Ethiopia long ago, or maybe they are descendants of former slaves whom landowners obtained to work on plantations. As for her hairy exterior, it can be explained by such a disease as hypotrichosis, which can be acquired due to hormonal changes caused by hunger and deprivation. Zana was supposedly a girl with intellectual disability who got lost in the woods and went feral. Well, the final piece of evidence. In 2021, an article was published that examined the DNA of Zana and her son Hvid. The results from independent laboratories show that the genetic line of the woman believed to be Zana comes from Central Equatorial Africa, between South Sudan and West Africa. So, Zana was not abominable snowman, after all, but quite the opposite. New Chronology The New Chronology is a concept of radical revision of world history, created by a group led by Anatoly Timofeyevich Fomenko. A well-known scientist, by the way, an academician of the Russian Academy of Sciences, however, in the field of mathematics. In the field of history, his thesis are quite specific. In brief, according to Fomenko and his New Chronology, there are no reliable historical sources older than the 17th century. And the history of mankind itself is actually shorter than is commonly believed, because many events and historical figures of different centuries, in his opinion, are simply duplicated. The scientist believes that in fact the history of mankind can be traced back to the 10th century, which he did with the help of mathematical calculations and analysis of astronomical maps of the starry sky on the monuments of antiquity. The authors of the new chronology, unlike many similar theories, claim that the events of antiquity were not invented by some later writers. They are real, but actually occurred not in deep antiquity, as we were accustomed to think, but in a much closer to us era of 11th to 13th centuries, that is, in the Middle Ages. At the same time, many believe that Fomenko did not lose his mind in his old age, and new chronology was born originally as a scientific joke of representatives of exact sciences over humanities. But then, in the turbulent 90s, he saw a chance to turn these ideas into money, to transform his theory into a commercial project, and it worked. Only by the beginning of 2011, more than 100 books with a total circulation of about 800,000 copies were published within the framework of the new chronology. 
Moreover, in recent books he goes further and further away from official history. For example, now he claims that the events of the second half of the 18th century, the Pugachev Rebellion and the War of Independence in the United States, were fought on the territory of a huge unified Mongol-Russian Empire, which allegedly existed before that time and controlled Siberia and North America. Let us not condemn the scientists who just wanted to make money on gullible people, who love conspiracy theories about the lies of official science. Beria was a pedophile. Lavrenti Beria was a sinister leader of the Soviet security services during the Stalin era. What is surprising is that Beria survived the era, unlike dozens of other prominent political figures. What is even more surprising is that Lavrenti Beria's reputation is perhaps even worse than that of Joseph Stalin himself, who is considered by many to be a murderous tyrant, by the way. Even the Wikipedia states that Beria was a prolific sexual predator who serially raped scores of girls and young women. And the indictment of the heir to Stalin, arrested in 1953, mentioned the rape of an underage girl. At the time, it was claimed that the number of Soviet women seduced by the ex narcom could go into the hundreds. A very popular story is that in the late 40s and early 50s, families were literally afraid to let their female children go out alone, as black cars with NKVD officers were cruising the streets of Moscow, looking for victims for the lecherous chief, Lavrin Tiberia. And allegedly, the young age of the victims never bothered Lavrenti, but rather pleased him. Rafael Sarkisov, Colonel of State Security and Personal Guard of Beria, specially kept a list of his boss's mistresses. It contained 39 names. And another one. There were 75. And one more. 115. The story of Black Cars may very well not be a complete fiction either. Colonel Sarkisov in his testimony said that he was personally responsible for the fact that Beria always had mistresses. Women were selected on the basis of their appearance. No one was interested in their age, social status and the like. Beria only pointed his finger out of the car window or instructed the guards to follow the lady he liked. One way or another, Lavrin Tipalovich got what he wanted. Well, and now I'll try to be objective. I don't like Beria, but there are no actual documents or evidence of Beria's proclivities. Lavrin Tiberia most likely was indeed a terrible person, had lots of mistresses and probably was a sexual predator. But the age of his victims is not so clear. It is quite possible that this story was fabricated to vilify the all-powerful head of the NKVD immediately after his arrest in 1953. Especially since even the USSR it would have been very difficult to conceal the disappearance of hundreds of children in the capital city. Beria's criminal case files themselves are classified, although most of the case materials were published in the press later. Therefore, even here we can say that contrary to rumors about mass rapes of Beria, the case contains only one statement about rape, which I mentioned at the beginning. The statement came from Beria's long-term mistress Drazdova, with whom he had a child and who was 16 years old when they met. And it's possible that this statement was written under the pressure of the investigation, as in fact was the testimony of Sarkisov, who was arrested on the same day as his boss. After all, the final version of the verdict does not include these charges. Only treason. Bislan the terrorist attack in the city of Bislan in 2004, when on September 1st terrorists took over 1,000 hostages in a local school and held them captive for three days in dire conditions, is the worst in the history of Russia. On the third day, an explosion occurred in the school gym where the hostages were held and they started to run out of the building, which forced the FSB troops to storm the school. All but one of the terrorists were eliminated, but the explosions, fire and chaotic shooting killed 333 people. The investigation lodged by the Prosecutor General's office nearly 20 years ago is still open. Like many other major terrorist attacks, Bislan did not avoid the emergence of numerous rumors and conspiracy theories. Many circumstances including the actual number of terrorists, the possible escape of many of them, the government's actions during the negotiations and the storming of the building and the reasons for the strange media coverage are still being debated. Let us go through the most common conspiracy theories. The most popular one among the relatives of the victims is that the first explosion, followed by the storming, occurred not inside the school by the terrorists themselves, but due to the FSB shelling of the building. 
According to this version, the special forces fired flamethrowers at the school for some reason, which caused a huge explosion of the makeshift explosive device, roof collapse, fire and casualties. This version was vehemently defended by Duma deputy Yuri Savelyev, who was a member of the Government Investigation Commission. He was not satisfied with the official conclusion of the commission, in 2006 he presented his own report. According to it, the school was allegedly shelled from outside with grenade launchers and flamethrowers, tanks fired combat shells, and there were twice as many terrorists as claimed by the investigation. The second most popular theory is that some of the terrorists were able to escape in the turmoil during the assault. In particular, several hostages claimed that one of the militants who had a large scar on his throat was never identified among the corpses. One hostage, Zarina Puhaeva, testified to the presence of a female sniper of Slavic appearance, whom she did not see among the terrorist corpses. There is an assumption that the terrorist gang, after taking over the school, was divided into two factions – mercenaries and martyrs. While the former did their work solely for money and intended to live under the cover of hostages, the latter came to accept death in the name of Allah. And that it was the conflict between these factions that led to the explosion on September 3rd, after which the mercenaries managed to escape while the martyrs continued to fight to the end. Theory number 3. On September 1, 2004, one of the federal news channels reported that the terrorists had handed over a videotape recording the events of the school. An hour later, the same channel, citing the press service of the North Ossetian government, reported that the tape handed over earlier turned out to be empty. There were rumors among local residents that what was recorded on the tape was so terrible that it was decided to destroy it. Shamil Basayev, the organizer of the terrorist attack, claimed that the tape contained an appeal from the hostages to Vladimir Putin, in which they demanded the withdrawal of Russian troops from Chechnya. Another theory is about who prepared the attack, with the United States, Britain, Saudi Arabia and other countries mentioned among those involved. In general, to be honest, none of these theories seem very plausible to me, and some of them seem to be made to whitewash the terrorists and put the blame on someone else, which I strongly condemn. So finally, here's the last conspiracy theory, not directly related to the attack itself. The fact is that around the early 2010s, Mikhail Shufutinsky's song September the 3rd written in the mid-90s, became insanely popular. And since then, about every year on this date, all social networks are flooded with endless memes about this song. There is an opinion that this meme appeared in the Russian segment of the internet not organically, but was deliberately forced by pro-government bloggers and websites. Also, that the first association with this date in people's memory would be a funny meme about turning the page of a calendar, not Bislan. Elephant's food. To prevent the spread of radioactive elements from the destroyed Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, a massive concrete structure was hastily built over it by November 1986. It should prevent the airborne spread of radioactive material, but it probably won't provide complete safety. All because of the elephant's food. It's a nickname given to the large mass of corium that leaked out of the reactor in the 1986 Chernobyl accident. Elephant food may be the deadliest object on Earth. According to analysis, it is a solidified mass of radioactive lava containing radionuclides from irradiated nuclear fuel, consisting of silicon dioxide, titanium, zirconium, magnesium and uranium. At the time of the leak, the mass was slowly flowing down the premises, mixing with sand, concrete and metal structures. The food was discovered only in December 1986, as the rooms where it was located were in the most dangerous and contaminated area of the former reactor. This super-dense substance, which is practically impossible to drill, could be damaged only by Kalashnikov shots and armor-piercing shells. And to this day, almost after 40 years, it is a radioactive, non-cooling formation that cannot be approached even with the strictest safety measures. According to experts, after 30 seconds of being near the elephant's food, a person will feel dizziness and fatigue. In 2 minutes, bleeding and fever would begin. In 4 minutes, vomiting and diarrhea. In another minute, the level of contamination of the body will reach a critical point, after which death will occur in two days. According to various estimates, the food will be radioactive for another 100,000 years. Some experts believe that the sarcophagus over the power plant have created additional pressure on the ground around Unit 4, and in the future the foundation may simply collapse. 
As a result, the elephant's foot and other formation of radioactive waste will get into the soil and eventually begin to leach out, poisoning, first of all, underground water sources. This will lead to a humanitarian catastrophe of gigantic proportions. Heroin candy This is actually a variation of the old Soviet myth about razor blades and gum. Allegedly, some insidious agents are at work in Russian cities, putting up posters where children are invited to take a candy bar. Attached to the ads are sweets stuffed with a little dose of a narcotic substance. Since 2014, almost every year, different versions of this legend have circulated among concerned parents in a variety of messengers. One about new Chinese candy that children can order through the mail. The other about mysterious strangers offering children a taste of drug-filled candy. The other about large bags of drug-filled candy that have been found in the schools. All in all, a typical urban legend without much evidence of reality. Military Unit Number 10003 But what was definitely real was a military unit created in the 80s as a part of the Ministry of Defense of the USSR and then Russia to study the possibilities of military application of paranormal phenomena. Yes, the USSR officially had a unit whose main task was to investigate the paranormal. In the late 1980s, the USSR Minister of Defense, Marshal Yazov, was increasingly approached by psychics offering their services. The psychics promised to easily search for enemy submarines, discover missing ships and people, diagnose and treat diseases. The general staff of the armed forces of the USSR was assigned the task of analyzing the unusual proposals of the applicants and studying the possibility of applying their superpowers in practice. In 1989, in order to solve this problem, Troop Unit No. 10003 was established. Colonel Savin, who by that time had proven himself by conducting a number of studies in this area, was appointed commander of the military unit. Initially, the highest level of secrecy was set for Unit 10003. Savin was authorized to report directly only to the chief of the general staff. Even the ministers of defense did not have detailed information about the activities of this unit. The scheme of financing of the Unit 10003 was developed personally by the USA Minister of Finance Valentin Pavlov, and in such a way that it worked smoothly until the end of 2003. As Savin recalls, in the early 1990s, psychic information was received about a possible nuclear explosion in the Glasgow area. The information was conveyed to the British. They, strangely enough, believed, checked, and indeed, literally at the last moment, were able to prevent a very serious for themselves and all of Western Europe technogenic and ecological catastrophe. The explosion, as it turned out, could have occurred at one of NATO's nuclear facilities. Savin also claimed that during the First Chechen War, his subordinates had detected minefields of Chechen fighters, located their command centers and the direction of terrorist attacks. However, there is no evidence of the effectiveness of this unit's work, or it is strictly classified. Underground Königsberg Underground Königsberg is a hypothetical hidden German city under Kaliningrad. The idea behind the legend is the presence of a network of various underground structures under Kaliningrad. Bunkers, various storage facilities, one of which contains the Amber Room, tunnels, military factories and even airfields. It is believed that during the Soviet assault on the city, the Germans blocked the entrances to the underground city and partially flooded it. Since the early 50s of the last century, there has been a rumor that Germany offered the Soviet leadership to rebuild Kaliningrad in exchange for the treasures hidden in underground Königsberg. In fact, there are many underground passages on the territory of modern Kaliningrad. They were built at different times, some of them appeared in the Middle Ages. These dungeons are located at great depths and are not easily accessible, so they are only partially explored. There is also the heritage of Nazi Germany, military dungeons. There are those that were built for secret transportation, communication centers, workshops. There were also saboteur bases, many of them appeared in the summer of 1944 when it became clear to the Nazis that the Soviets were approaching. About 30 such bases and a network of underground passages were created. There were a lot of air defense shelters in almost every yard. Large factories had their own shelters with underground passages for evacuation. And even many neighboring houses were connected by underground passages in case one house collapsed and the inhabitants could get out through the other. 
In addition, a railroad tunnel runs underneath Victory Square, formerly Hansa Platz. If you walk through the tunnel, you can see several doorways that have been bricked up. In the 1950s-1960s, all these passages were not sealed, and people, especially children, used to sneak in there. Actually, it is these grown-up children who now tell stories about underground Königsberg. The Rhine did a lot of dungeons in the city, not all of them are accessible now, some of them are lost. But it's probably not enough to talk about a full-fledged underground city, and especially not about some treasures hidden there. The Nuclear War of 1812 A nuclear war occurred on Earth in 1812. After that, the planet faced terrible consequences, forests were destroyed and nuclear winter came. Naturally, this led to the death of most of humanity in the 19th century, especially in the territories of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. The favorite argument of the supporters of this hypothesis is the fact that radioactive remains of people and animals are sometimes found here and there. Well, and the year without summer of 1816, the cause of which was a grand fire of Russian forests, not some volcanic eruption in Indonesia as in the official history. Allegedly, Muscovites bombed Napoleon's army so furiously, and Napoleon bombed Muscovites so violently, that all the forests in Russia up to the Pacific Ocean burned down. And now there are almost no trees in Russia older than 200 years. Moscow burned to the ground, including brick buildings, which means that the fire in 1812 was extraordinary. I have already mentioned the round lakes craters from atomic bombs. Finally, cancer allegedly appeared only in the 19th century and precisely after this war. One problem with this theory. Everyone has different versions of who actually bombed whom with these nuclear weapons. Napoleon bombed Russians in Moscow. Russians bombed him when he entered Moscow. Then Anglo-Saxons bombed both. Aliens. Reptiloids. But the reasons for concealing these events are usually the same. Someone powerful, the world government for example, does not want the Russian people to regain their former greatness and technological advantage. Samazlika Mamalaev Rose Samazlika and Mamalaeva are two small villages in the Republic of Mordovia in the European part of Russia. One has 260 inhabitants, the other 420. There is nothing exciting in the villages themselves, we are interested in a small road between them. There are two roads from Samazlika to Mamalaeva, one long through the village of Stara Ryabka, but for some reason most of the locals use that road, although there is a short path, about 3-4 kilometers in total, a clay road with birch windbreak on one side and a young forest on the other. And the most unpleasant thing is a long mud puddle along the road, covered with reeds. The place is quite creepy in the dark, but the main problem is that there are a lot of strange rumors about it among the locals. Allegedly, at night women's screams can be heard from one side of the road or the other, and whoever is screaming changes his position with inhuman speed. Other people have seen a female silhouette that calls the locals by name and periodically moves closer and farther away from them. Some people said that at night they periodically saw two lights from car headlights that literally chased people. According to folk beliefs, from ancient times various evil beings gather for a coven in one of the forests nearby, and as on the nights of the coven one can easily disappear on this road. Nicholas I committed suicide. March 2, 1855. In the midst of unsuccessful Russia Crimean War, Emperor Nicholas I died. His death was preceded by a strange story. In early February, the Emperor caught a slight cold. Despite the indisposition, he went to the inspection of troops in a light coat and open sledges at 20 degree frost. The next day, he repeated the trip, which angered his doctor. In the evening of the same day, Nicholas I went to bed and never got up again. In the first days after the death of Nicholas I, the rumors began to spread with lightning speed. The first rumor is that Nicholas I could not bear the defeat in the Crimean campaign and committed suicide. The second legend is that his personal dog, Samant, poisoned the Tsar. 
The illness started against the background of disappointing news from the besieged Sevastopol and worsened after receiving news of the fail of General Khrulev at the storming of Yevpatoria, which was perceived as a harboring of inevitable defeat in the war, which Nicholas, by the nature of his character, could not survive. The Emperor's going out to a parade in the freezing cold without an overcoat was taken as an intention to get a fatal cold. According to the story, Dr. Mant told the Tsar, Sire, this is worse than death, it is suicide. Nevertheless, during February, the sick Emperor did exactly that several times. As for the second version, after a month of fairly sluggish illness, on March 1st, the Emperor's condition suddenly deteriorated sharply. In the morning of March 2nd came agony, which lasted several hours, which does not usually happen during pneumonia. According to a rumor that spread immediately, the Emperor at his request was given poison by the same Dr. Mant. The Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna directly accused Mant of poisoning her brother. In addition, people who came to say goodbye to Nicholas I noticed that the posthumous changes in the body of the Emperor took place unusually fast, and that the embalming for some reason was either carried out incorrectly or did not work. Mant hastily left Russia, and this intensified the rumors about the doctor poisoner. At the same time, the Emperor himself had forbidden the autopsy of his body even before his death. In 1923, an article by historian Natalia Stackelberg, The Mystery of the Death of Nicholas I, was published, in which the researcher drew attention to contradictions in the Chamber Fourier journals, daily chronicles of court life. Stackelberg suggested that the contradictions she identified could indicate an attempt by the authorities to clean up the content of the journals and conceal possible evidence of Nicholas's suit. Nevertheless, the prevailing opinion among modern historians is that most likely Emperor Nicholas I died from bacterial pneumonia and its complications. Antibiotics had not yet been discovered, not from poison. But whether he tried to aggravate it on purpose or was just stubborn and did not listen to doctors, no one will ever know. The Silent Dawn, a real author. The novel And Quiet Flows the Dawn, or The Silent Dawn, written by Mikhail Sholokhov, is one of the most important literary works in the Russian language written in the 20th century. And this novel is also the subject of one of the fiercest literary controversies of the last century. Allegedly, the author of the novel is not Mikhail Sholokhov. The first rumors of plagiarism appeared in 1928, along with the release of the first two volumes of The Silent Dawn in the magazine October. It implies that Sholkov had appropriated the manuscript from the field bag of a nameless white officer shot by the Bolsheviks and published it under his own name. Sholkov was aware of the rumors and even asked to organize a special commission of writers to check the manuscript of the novel. The commission found Sholkov's authorship indisputable. Another ten years later, a new wave of rumors appeared. Allegedly, the real author of the novel was a famous Cossack writer, a member of the White Movement, Fyodor Krukov, who died in 1920 of Tithus. Allegedly, Sholkov's father-in-law served with him in the White Army. After Krukov's death, he passed the manuscript of his friend to his son-in-law. Since the 1970s in the West, and after perestroika in both the USSR and Russia, a number of studies have appeared according to which And Quiet Flows the Dawn does not belong to Sholokhov and was written in the 1910s and during the Civil War by the original author, apparently a Cossack and a participant in the White Movement. It has been claimed that in 1925-1927, in the process of preparing the Silent Dawn for publication, the original text was subjected to extensive and inconsistent editing, a number of plot lines were cut, unmotivated inserts from memoirs of Civil War participants were included, and various distortions were made. Moreover, some even hypothesized that Sholkov himself never even wrote his other works and was nothing more than the face of a successful literary project of the Soviet secret services, for which numerous Soviet writers worked and which eventually brought the USSR the prestigious Nobel Prize. In 1999, after many years of searching, the Gorky Institute of World Literature of the Russian Academy of Sciences managed to find the manuscripts of the first and second volumes of The Silent Dawn which were considered lost, the same manuscript that Sholkov presented to the commission in 1929. The conclusion was unambiguous. There is no doubt that 605 pages of this manuscript were written by the hand of Mikhail Alexandrovich Sholokhov. 
but opponents of this version do not give up. They believe that the fact that the first manuscript of the novel is written by Sholokhov's hand in no way contradicts the version that he appropriated some diaries of a certain white officer and simply rewrote them. But why did so much doubt arise in the first place? In fact, if we approach it from the point of view of literary studies, there will be dozens of arguments both for and against. And if we speak simply, the first and the main reason for doubts in Sholkhov's authorship is that an unusually young author, he was not even 25, without a good education, created a grandiose work in a short period of time, demonstrating a good knowledge of the life of the Don Cossacks with its everyday details, knowledge of many places on the Don, and the events of the First World War and the Civil War, which took place when Sholokhov was still a child and a teenager. But with all this brilliant knowledge, he sometimes makes weird mistakes, which the author with such a level of knowledge it would seem simply could not allow. In Sholokhov's drafts there are numerous corrections, but they can be interpreted as errors in rewriting from the original manuscript made by another person. And of course, the phrase of Sholkhov himself, said by him at the 18th Congress of the VKPB in March 1939, still remains a mystery. We won't throw away our field bags. This Japanese custom is not to our liking. We will collect other people's bags. Because in our literary business, the contents of these bags will come in handy later. After defeating our enemies, we'll write books about how we defeated them. The Brosnan Monster You think only the Scots have the Loch Ness Monster? Well, we have the Brosnan Monster. It is a dragon-like cryptid, according to local beliefs, that supposedly lives in Lake Brosna in the Tver region of Russia. According to the descriptions of eyewitnesses, this creature is scaly like a reptile with a size of at least 5 meters. In ancient Russia, people believe that the monster living at the bottom takes revenge on anyone who comes to the Russian land with evil thoughts. The first to feel the righteous anger of the monster was the leader of bandits, who planned to transport the looted goods across the lake. As soon as the laden ship was on the water, from its depth rose a terrifying creature with a giant mouth and began to destroy the boat, devouring all the bad people. Also, according to the legend, the Brosnan monster came out of the water when the army of the Mongolian Khan Bati was passing along the lake. The monster attacked the horde, forcing them to abandon their campaign aimed at Novgorod. Recently, there was even a reality show in which television crews watched the lake every day and tried to debunk the myth of a Brosnan monster. They found huge beaver dams in the forest, which allowed them to assume that the locals had mistaken a large beaver for the monster. Well, and later it turned out that at the bottom of the lake there are active rotting processes due to the trees and plants falling into the river. In connection with this, accumulations of methane and hydrogen sulfide are formed, and from time to time they rise to the surface, especially if the lake waters are disturbed, for example, by a dropped anchor. These gases can affect the human condition, cause hallucinations and mental confusion, and the bubbles and form on the surface could very well pass for the breath of a terrifying monster. Holodomor was a setup. Let's be clear, researchers and politicians around the world are still debating whether or not to consider the Holodomor in Ukraine in the 1930s a genocide by the Soviet authorities or just a tragedy caused, among other things, by their miscalculations. Plus, there are many admirers of the USSR who generally deny any famine in those years and argue that Comrade Stalin would not have allowed such a thing. The entire thing is a fabrication of the enemies of Soviet power. That's not what this theory is about. The theory is that there really was a Holodomor and that it really was organized by someone on purpose and it really was indirectly caused by the actions of the Soviet authorities. But those very authorities were simply manipulated and tricked. By whom? <sighs> the damned Americans, of course. Allegedly, Secretary of State Robert Langsing was the first to put forward the idea to strangle the Bolsheviks with devastation and hunger. And it was back in 1990. In 1925, the same America, Britain and France imposed a gold blockade against the USSR. Henceforth, our country could not buy goods in the West even for gold. No loans, too. 
The country can now only gain foreign currency from the sale of its goods or raw materials abroad. Meanwhile, they imposed sanctions on timber, asbestos, manganese and so on. What remains not under sanctions and what the USSR is forced to sell to the West? Grain. As a result, either Stalin will not dare to sell grain and will derail the industrialization plan, after which the Soviet power will fall victim to military aggression, being unable to fight off the much better equipped and armed armies of the capitalists. Or Stalin will dare, there will be a famine, the people will revolt and the Soviet power will also fall. A win-win plan. But Comrade Stalin outplayed everyone, took away grain only from the damned kulaks, of which there were too many in Ukraine, and the USSR stood firm. Frankly, even outright denial of it sounds more plausible. Fallen Churches Fallen Churches is a rather unique phenomenon that can be found only in Russia. The fact is that in the folklore of different regions of the country, mainly in the legends of the Russian Northwest, but also in Kalugat, in Tula, in Voronezh, there are dozens of stories about ancient Orthodox churches, temples, monasteries or chapels that stood for hundreds of years and then suddenly disappeared on the ground. Particularly common is the story that church members committed some kind of sin, after which the heavens opened and the sinners were turned into stones and the churches tainted by sin went under the ground. For example, in the Kaluga region there is a popular legend that a husband and wife went to the church to baptize a child, and on the way succumbed to a temptation of a quick sin, literally 200 meters from the church, and God turned them into two stones, a bigger and a smaller one, and the church itself disappeared and now there is only a hill on its place. Often in the place of fallen churches water reservoirs appear, sometimes whole lakes where at night the bells are supposedly heard ringing and the water from which has special properties. In these reservoirs are usually considered sacred places where some kind of communication between this and the other world can occur. It would seem to be another legend of folklore, but its prevalence in completely different regions is surprising. If we also take into account the abundance of cast sinkholes on the territory of European part of Russia, it is quite possible that these stories do have some truth in them, and the churches could go under the ground here and there because of the subsidence of the soil beneath them. Theory of passionarity. In fact, this is a rather interesting and to some extent even scientific theory proposed by the Soviet historian and philosopher Lev Gumilov. Its purpose was to explain the different stages of humanity's development as well as how different ethnic groups appear and then disappear. For this purpose, Gumilov introduces the concept of passionarity. Gumilov explains the differences in the development and fate of different ethnic groups by the fact that a relatively small part of its members have a desire, conscious or not, to radically transform reality. Passionarity is a characteristical dominant, an irresistible inner striving for activity aimed at the realization of some goal. The goal is sometimes more valuable to a passionary individual than even his own life, and even more so than the lives and happiness of his contemporaries. That is, passionary people or passionarians are certain individuals who literally single-handedly move mankind forward. As examples of such people, the philosopher cited Jan Kruz, John of Arc or Ivan Susanin, those who have sacrificed their lives for their beliefs and principles. In them, as Gumilev explained, passionarity manifested itself at the highest level. On the level below, there are outstanding personalities striving for success. Alexander the Great, Kant, Columbus, Newton, Lomonosov that is, general scientists, intellectuals, discoverers. At the opposite end of the spectrum were the sub-passionarians, incapable of any noticeable change and of transforming the landscape, completely dependent on circumstances and leading a parasitic lifestyle. In the middle were harmonious individuals, or harmonics, whose instinct for self-preservation and desire to influence the environment were at approximately the same level. In fact, the idea is quite interesting. The only problem is that Gumilev did not present any proof of the idea. And what is this passionarity? How to calculate it? Is it changes in the neurons of the brain? 
some special substances in people's blood, the level of midichlorians. According to Gumilev, passionarity arises under the influence of some cosmic radiation. From time to time there are mass mutations that increase the level of passionarity, passionary shocks. They last no longer than a few years, affect a small territory up to 200 kilometers, located along the geodetic line of the Earth and stretching several thousand kilometers. Proofs? Trust me, bro. Why did some ethnic groups have more passionary personalities and others less? And why did these second ethnic groups disappear? Who knows? Apparently cosmic rays fell that way. And finally, who are these real passionarians? For example, let's take France. A passionarian of the highest order was Joan of Arc, ok. But was Jean-Paul Marat or his assassin Charlotte Cordet? Which one of them moves his ethnos forward, as a true passionarian should? And of course, the eternal question. What about Hitler? Afghan Rats This story happened in Russia almost 30 years ago. Rich people of the country, in search of constant exotic innovations, often got puppies of the Dachshund breed, which was unaffordable for average Russians. So one woman decided to buy herself such a puppy. Time passed, but for some reason the puppy did not look like his kin. He was growing, but he was getting kind of ugly. And he loved to eat. And he loved to sleep with his owner. That's fine. But one night the owner wakes up at night from inexplicable fear and unpleasant stupor. And the puppy is sitting on her chest and looking at her. The woman didn't pay much attention to it, but the scenario repeated itself time after time, and each time it was more and more creepy. Eventually she couldn't take it anymore and went to the vet with the now grown puppy. When he saw the dog's hunt, he was horrified and immediately called the police, who were unable to capture the animal for a long time. The dog's hunt fought back violently, was very aggressive and the law enforcement had to shoot the animal. During the investigation it became clear that it was not a dog's hunt at all, but an Afghan rat, which was the size of a dog and practically did not differ in appearance. Only an expert could identify such a rat. The animal is very strong and unpredictable, it can kill not only a small child but also a grown man. It also possessed a hypnotizing stare that would cloud its victim's mind so it could then eat them. That's the story. Putin's Georgian mother In the 2000s, it was a popular theory in Russia that Vladimir Putin's mother actually lived in Georgia. Details about the first 10 years of Putin's life are scarce in his autobiography, especially compared to other world leaders. Officially, Vladimir Vladimirovich said his parents died before he became president. And then came Vera Nikolaevna Putina. A Georgian woman who has claimed since 1999 that Vladimir Putin, Vova, is her son. According to Vera Putin's words published in 2006, her son lived in the Georgian village of Mitehi from the age of 2 to 10 and then was sent to his grandparents, Putin's father's parents, who lived in the town of Achor Perm region. This is confirmed by records at a local school, according to which a certain Volodya Putin studied there in 1959-1960. In addition, she claimed that Putin was two years older than his registered date of birth. Putin believed that the Leningrad-based parents mentioned in Putin's official biography had adopted her son from his grandparents. She then learned through her contacts that her son had been in the KGB, and in 1999 she saw him on television for the first time. Notably, the population of Mitehi now avoids talking to the press, but some locals remember little Vova and confirm that he is the Russian president. Putin died in Tbilisi, Georgia in May 2023 at the age of 96. Naturally, no one has ever conducted any DNA test, so this theory remains just a theory, ramblings of some old woman. Although, here's an interesting fact. Allegedly, journalist Artem Baravik, who died on March 9, 2000 as a result of an airplane crash, believed this theory. Allegedly, the plane crash coincidentally happened at the moment when he was shooting a documentary about Putin's childhood, including a report on Vera Putina. For the record, I certainly do not believe in it. Wolf Messing 
and the Nath of Soviet entertainer with psychic abilities. But unlike Chumak and Kashpirovsky, he emerged not in the troubled times of Perestroika, but early. He started in the 40s and gave concerts for almost three decades throughout the country, gathering thousands of people. Wolf Messing, aka Wolf Grishkovich, also performed on television with psychological experiments on reading the thoughts of viewers. He himself explained it like this. This is not mind reading, but if I may say so, muscle reading. When a person thinks about something intensely, the brain cells transmit impulses to all the muscles of the body. Their movements, imperceptible to the eye, are easily perceived by me. I often perform mental tasks without direct contact with the inductor. The frequency of the inductor's breathing, the beating of his pulse, the timbre of his voice, the character of his gait, etc. can serve as a pointer for me. The press repeatedly spoke about Messing's participation in solving various crimes, catching a spy, pointing out the true murderer during the trial, and so on. But in fact, there is no information about any meetings with him in the archives of special services. And how could he do without predictions? Like all other soothsayers, he predicted his own death, as well as the death of Stalin, during a personal meeting which scared Joseph. The day of the end of World War II and the death of Hitler. Also during a personal meeting, Hitler got angry and put him in prison, from which Messing escaped by hypnotizing all the guards. And what about the future? According to Messing, at the beginning of the 21st century, because of some small piece of land, a global crisis in a large country will begin, which will lead to devastation in the world. In the future, the most serious threat to Russia will be China. Moreover, it will hide its aggression under the mask of a friend and partner. The Third World War should begin as a result of a nuclear strike of China on Japan and Taiwan. Russia will be the adversary of the Chinese. The USA, by the middle of the 21st century, according to Messing's vision, will lose any leading positions in the world and will become a second world country. Well, let's wait and see. And that's it for today, I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, a huge thank you to my biggest supporters. Elizabeth Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berzi, Jimmy Elbin, Eli, Petr Ilich and Bruce Etzenik. See you guys next time.